Welcome uh, everybody uh, here. Uh, this is a special occasion for me to greet um, someone who is on every list of the most powerful women in the world um, and someone who belongs to us uh, here at Yale SOM and has from the very beginning belonged to us I would say not just because she went here but because in so many ways in every speech she gives and in uh, every time you see her spotlighted, I can just hear the SOM niche um, <laughs> exuding from her, and I think we'll see some of that today. Uh, what we're going to do is have a conversation. Uh, so I'm going to ask some questions, and she's going to give some answers. And, uh, and then at the end, we'll probably have a question, time for one or two questions uh, from the audience as well. And hopefully, we won't wander too far off the kinds of topics you'd like to hear. So, uh, inter um, when I was in, uh, last saw you, we were in India, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that you spoke about and several of your leaders uh, spoke about was your Performance with Purpose program. Mm -hmm. And I, I was very taken by it and actually came back and we run a leadership development program class and spoke with it to my class um, because for me it resonated again with the SOM leadership model, the model of what it is we do. So I wondered if we could start there. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by performance with purpose, mm -hmm. what's special about it, and then put a plug in maybe for how it comes <laughs> from your SOM background. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not to lead the witness. Sharon, um, I wouldn't call it a movement. Uh, performance with purpose is how we run the company. And uh, mm -hmm. to really understand the genesis of performance with purpose and what it's done for the company, should go back a bit. I became CEO in October of 2006. And uh, I strongly believed then, as I do now, that all corporations operate from a license, with a license from society. We're all limited liability companies. And the reason we have limited liability is because society gives us a license to operate. And because we have the license to operate, we owe society a duty of care, which means that if you operate in a society, you have to worry about the costs that you as a company are imposing on society. And it is not right to think of your P&L as revenues less your own costs and that's your profit. It's really revenues, less cost, less cost to society. That's the real profit because you can't toss costs onto taxpayers. So if you start with that as a notion of the enterprise, you have to start thinking about what can you do to reduce those costs that you pass on to society. Okay? And nobody's going to calculate that for you and tell it to you exactly what it is. It's what you feel. And the reason it's important to think that way is because all employees in PepsiCo are first mothers, fathers, children, husbands, wives, aunts, uncles, before they are employees of PepsiCo. And the only way that we thought we'd get the best and brightest to come and work at PepsiCo is if we allowed themselves to bring their whole selves to work, not park themselves at the door and walk in and be somebody else. So we had to think about how we articulate the direction of the company in a way that makes everybody feel very good about the company, not because of our financial performance alone, although that's necessary, but in terms of the holistic impact we have on society. So the question was, how can we deliver performance with purpose? And I'll define purpose for you such that taken together, performance cannot be delivered without purpose, and purpose leads to performance. So the way we define purpose was in three planks. The first is the whole notion of uh, human sustainability. You know, we are in the business of food and beverage. We feed people. How do we make sure that our portfolio, which tended to be all fun for you products, also gave people a choice to have highly nutritious, great tasting products? And even for the fun for your products, how do you reduce the sugar levels, the fat levels, sodium levels? How do you do that? So we took upon ourselves an explicit goal to start altering the portfolio. But not just words. We set goals, milestones. We hired a new R&D team. We put it in everybody's performance appraisal. So that was the first plank. Now, as I said to you earlier, if we didn't transform the portfolio, people wouldn't consume as many products because society was changing. So you needed to transform the portfolio to deliver performance. So the first was, how do you make sure of healthier people? And while you transform the portfolio, how do you work with communities to put physical education back in schools? How do you improve calorie labeling, nutrition education? All of that was part of that human sustainability plank. 
The second was environmental sustainability. How do you make sure that our operations don't do bad things for the environment? Water reduction, energy, stepping up recycling in a massive way, all of that. Again, and within that, with the communities, how do you make sure that you only focus on sustainable agriculture? Because we buy potatoes, we buy corn, we buy oranges, we buy oats. How do you make sure in every country in which you operate, you operate uh, responsibly with agriculture? And the third part of purpose was something that I put in, felt very strongly about it is, how do you create an environment where our people feel like they can bring the, their whole selves to work? So that you can come to PepsiCo and not just make a living, but have a life. That was the whole concept. Mm -hmm. And unless you have great people, you can't deliver performance. So performance with purpose was about doing good by doing good. And taken together, what it has done for PepsiCo is it's unleashed the emotions of everybody in the company. Mm. And uh, for those of you who've seen the new Pepsi Refresh project, and if you haven't, please go to refresheverything.com and see what they've done. It's not a plug for a product because it's a campaign to give grants to communities instead of spending it on an advertising campaign for Pepsi. That to me takes performance with purpose to a whole new level and says, performance with purpose is not corporate social responsibility. Performance with purpose is about how you can intimately link what a company can do with what the needs of society are and together deliver great performance. Mm -hmm. And coming back to SOM, I think SOM self-selects great students. And I think SOM selects students who've got a soul, mm -hmm. who've got a deep, um, at least they did. <laughs> 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 uh, who have a deep sense of community, country, want to give back. And I think uh, what you learned in SOM, you carry through as you leave SOM. We still have those same students. I always say we have students with hearts and minds. Absolutely. And I think that's always been true from the beginning. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Indra, you mentioned briefly the, the nutrition obesity um, uh, program. And I remember, again, when I was with you in Purchase, we talked a little bit about the difficulty of taking on your critics. So here's a situation in which your whole industry has been criticized on nutritional grounds, on sugar, salt, all the, whatever you want, and you've chosen to work with mm. those critics. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges associated with that, while, how you came to think about doing it this way? It's very different from most of your yeah. other CEOs in similar areas. See, when the critics started about, you know, sugared beverages or salty snacks, um, the first reaction of any CEO it was of me to say, you're stupid because obesity is a multifaceted problem. You've got to worry about calories in, calories out. I mean, the usual guns come out. And mm -hmm. that's how most CEOs in our industry spoke about this issue. Um, but then we stepped back and said, wait a minute. Let's walk a mile in the shoes of the critics. So that's one of the rules we have in all of PepsiCo. Anybody who criticizes us, let's walk a mile in their shoes to understand if we were that critic, if we were that NGO, how would we approach PepsiCo? And then figure out how to work with them to evolve to a good solution. So when we sat down and talked to each of our critics, including Kelly Brownell, who's right here at the mm -hmm. Yale Rudd Center, who actually um, is a critic, but a responsible critic, because a lot of critics have the bully pulpit, but are not responsible, okay? Mm -hmm. But Kelly is a very responsible critic, and his point was, look, society has changed. There's nothing wrong with the products, but those were products for a different time. And how do you get people to have this notion of balance? I mean, this is about balance in your lifestyle. I mean, for those of you who've had a cold Pepsi, it's to die for, okay? But <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the, fa the fact of the matter is, Nobody asked you to drink a cold Pepsi sitting in front of a TV and not exercising. Nobody asked you to do that. Okay, but in today's world, in today's sedentary lifestyles, that's what people do. And then they say, oh, it's because of the Pepsi. I'll say it's because of cable TV, it's because of the computer. All of that is stupid. This is not about the blame game. The question is, we as a company that provides food and beverages can provide some solutions. What solutions can we provide? We can increase advertising on Diet Pepsi. We can reduce the sugar in regular Pepsi itself without sacrificing taste with some breakthrough. We can advertise asking people to get up and move. We can improve nutrition education. So all of that's right for society. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to cost to society. So as a company, we engaged with all the critics and we said, tell you what, let us take on action items to actually make a difference. And so 
we do not criticize the critics. We actually talk to every one of them, you know, Michael Jacobson of the Center for Science and Public Interest, who's a very outspoken critic, um, Kelly Brownell, any of these people, we actually talk with them. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we violently disagree, but at least we've listened to their point of view. Uh, but I will tell you one thing, uh, I think a couple of years ago at a shareholder meeting, um, one of the water critics came, um, mm -hmm. and you know, they usually come in large numbers to the shareholder meetings, and they usually come with boxes of letters from their constituents uh, criticizing the company's behavior. Mm -hmm. So they brought me, I think, 2,500 letters in a box. And I took the letters, I read a few of them quickly before the meeting. Then they all line up. Those of you who've been in shareholder meetings, in a free question and answer time, anybody can line up at the microphone and ask the CEO any question. So they line up all of them, all the water critics, and they tell me about water scarcity, water shortage. I listened to them for about three minutes and I looked at them and said, how many of you have grown up in a water shortage environment? Not one of them. I said, I have. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you how I approach water shortage. I feel it. I mean, you might talk about it. I feel it. And let me tell you what PepsiCo is doing about it. And for the next 10 minutes, I talked about what it is to grow with water shortage and why I feel strongly that we need to do something and we are doing something. Since then, they have been our best partners in working with us to address this issue of water uh, you know, replenishment and making sure that there's water efficiency. So I think when you engage with critics, when you're sincere about a dialogue, they too are willing to play ball with you as opposed to you fight back at them and they get more belligerent and more antagonistic. Surely some are suspicious though, Indra. Yeah. Um, and what do you do then? I mean, surely some people listen to you and think, oh sure, um, she's running you know, this big company, mm. she's good on her feet, but I don't really trust it. What do you do? Come and work at PepsiCo and see for yourself. <laughs> where, where, are, where are our two uh, PepsiCo uh, one, <laughs> Megan? You worked in environmental sustainability. You should stand. Ask her. Ask her the question. <laughs> <laughs> you but know, I, actually, I'll tell you, you, you're absolutely right in being suspicious. And you should be. I would be too if I didn't work for PepsiCo and I didn't lead it. But uh, at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is mm -hmm. in the eating. In today's world in particular, where everything has to be transparent, mm -hmm. where a sustainability report has to be approved by auditors and published, you have to look at that whole track mm -hmm. record. But let me also say something, Sharon. What do you gain by being suspicious? Yeah. Okay? I'd start off saying big companies are in fact good because they drive innovation, they provide mm -hmm. jobs, they're engine for growth. So let's figure out how to work with big companies to make a difference as opposed to you know, sounding like a communist and saying big companies are bad, mm -hmm. you know, we need to go to state-owned enterprises. Doesn't work. State-owned enterprises are the biggest polluters. Let's mm -hmm. not forget it. So I think we should start with trust because in today's world, I'm talking about Main Street. I'm not talking about anything else that caused the financial crisis. I'm talking about good Main Street that the preponderance of companies are doing just fine. Mm -hmm. I look at them and say, if you don't work constructively with them, how are we going to solve the problems of the world? So be suspicious, but you know, don't spend yeah. that much time on that suspicion. So I, I think that's great to show other people that being a partner is going to be useful for yeah. them as well, I think is a great way to go. Mm. So um, Indra, it's the Leaders Forum, mm. and um, you, know, you are again on every list of the great women leaders. Um, can you tell us a little bit about challenges that you face in leadership? Uh, what's your, how do you characterize your style of leadership? Are women leaders different from men leaders? <laughs> how are you different from other leaders you see? You spend a lot of time at places like Jeff Sonnenfeld's C <laughs> Sealy uh, mm. operation, watching how the rest of the guys behave. Mm. Tell us a little bit about what's, what's different, what you do well and not so well, how you think about leadership. You know, I'll tell you, um, somebody said to me, there are more books written about leadership than any other topic. And, he has uh, one, Mr. Sanchez. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> every, every person from movie stars to CEOs to uh, presidents have written books on leadership. I think leadership is a very personal thing. So mm -hmm. there are many definitions of leadership. Assume that every definition is right because, you know, it depends on your perspective. Mm -hmm. From a personal perspective, I tell you, um, leaders, especially CEOs, have to get 
an entire organization to do things they never thought they needed to do. Because you see a future before anybody else sees it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, on paper, it's impossible to be an effective CEO. But every CEO that I talk to, so I'm not unusual in this, is always looking around the bend and seeing things that the rest of the organization has not seen. And then you have to educate the rest of the organization, and they need to drag them to come along. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even worse when the company is doing well, because they'll say, if it ain't broke, why mm -hmm. fix it? And you go, because it's going to break. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know? Trust me, it's going to break. And so that's the worst message, because mm -hmm. turning around a successful company is harder than having a burning platform. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. because. When you're running a successful company, they go, what's wrong with her? Why is she articulating a burning platform and there isn't one? So in our case, I tell you, being a CEO, running a successful company has been the biggest problem because you've mm -hmm. constantly got to tell people we've got to reinvent ourselves. People go, but our playbook is just fine. Why do we have to reinvent mm -hmm. ourselves? Because that playbook is going to become obsolete in 12 months. How do you know? Trust me, the following 10 reasons. Yeah, but I can give you five other reasons why that's not the case. And so a CEO has to lead with the head, laying out all these scenarios, with your heart. You have got to show passion for the business, the people. You've got to treat each person as if they were the most important person in that company, especially your direct reports. You've got to overdo the caring and feeding of those people. And with your hands, so your head, heart, and hands, you've got to lead the company with all of that you've got to do. You can't just talk, you can't just give speeches. You've got to demonstrate that change can happen, you know, jump in and get into the details if it so requires. From a female versus male perspective, I don't even, I don't even know how to characterize my leadership style because I think over the years it's evolved. And depending on the people that work with me, I have to evolve my leadership style. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the most difficult thing because there isn't a cookbook that says, here's the way to run a $40 billion company. Here's a $60 billion company. Pick the book which says $60 billion and just read the chapters. Maybe, Jeff, you can write one. But there, but, there, but there isn't one. So you're writing the rules as you go along because we used to be $43 billion. In a few days, we're going to be $60 billion. How do you make this transition to go from 150,000 employees to 300,000 employees? Um, how do you all of a sudden take on that much more responsibility and you're the same person so you have to evolve as you go along. And for women in particular it's harder because we are sort of a victim of our own gender. Um, we have antenna that sticks out. So as I was talking to the women in management group, um, when I say guys and guys dealing with each other, when a man is a CEO and he has men working for him and the man walks him down, and has something on his mind, the man CEO just blows by and says, I need the following three things done. In my case, my antenna comes out. I shut the door. I go, what's the matter? Tell me about it. And all of a sudden, I'm drawn into the individual's issues and concerns and worries, as opposed to saying, oh, grow up. You're all professionals. So I think women CEOs, at least you asked about me. I cannot, nothing is, can be generalized. Some of us who rule with a head, heart, and hand, but with heart, head, and hand, you know, put that heart <laughs> before the head and hands like I do. Mm -hmm. We spend a disproportionate amount of time at work with the people. Mm -hmm. That's good and bad because it evokes a lot of commitment, but the bad is it's a lot of time. I'll give you one particular story, and this is one I'd like you guys to take away as you go to uh, work. About two years ago, I started to write to parents of my direct reports. Okay. And it happened because, you know, I am uh, Indian origin and I was in India and uh, my father passed away many, many years ago. My mom lives in India and I went home to spend time with her and every two minutes some stranger would show up home and my mom would say, this is the neighbor's fourth cousin, come and say hello. And I say, mom, I'm here on vacation, I want to rest. <laughs> and she'd say, you may come here for four days and leave, but I have to live with these people, so you better show up <laughs> and be on display. So I was dressed, you know, like I was going to a party morning to evening just to say hello to people. But the irony of it was they would come in, they'd say, oh, so this is the daughter. And then they'd blow past me in 30 seconds and go to my mom and say, you are so wonderful, you gave birth to this child, it's you, that's great. So my mom would just sit there taking all these compliments. <laughs> At that point, and you know, she's a very humble woman, but she loved this. 
So at that time, it occurred to me that every person is either a product or a victim of their upbringing. So I came back and I said, look, I have, at that time, I, between my direct reports and one more level, I had 27 of them. I said, all of these people who run PepsiCo are in fact the products of their upbringing. Mm. So I owe their parents a thank you. So I wrote to every one of the parents, a standard paragraph explaining why I was writing to them. And then I wrote very tailored two or three paragraphs about their son or daughter, thanking them for the gift of their child to PepsiCo. The emotion that is evoked has been unbelievable. And I write to them now once a year since then. But the emotion that's evoked is unbelievable. The they'll write me notes. Dear Indra, I just went to the store, I saw this. Maybe you should talk to my son to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> it is just, it is this private dialogue I have with the parents. They write to me about everything. I saw you on Squawk Box. I loved what you said. Bless you. I went to church and said a prayer for you. You know what? It's a private dialogue I have with parents, and I think it's, it, it increases the commitment of the executives to PepsiCo because it's brought the whole family in. We always wrote to spouses. That's a PepsiCo tradition. But now we uh, brought the parents in. And I say this to you because, remember I talked to you about ruling the company with heart, head, and hands? This is the hard part. And it takes more time. I also made a commitment which I think may have been a mistake, but I committed that I would visit every one of those parents. <laughs> so out of my 16 direct reports, I've done 10. I still have six to go. But they're not in the most readily accessible places. <laughs> but I'll get it done. It was worth it. Wait till I start writing to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> they would like that. What my parent actually said to me, since my son left high school, I haven't had a report card <laughs> until today. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there are probably not many male CEOs who are writing to people's parents, and I think it's I think a you're wonderful. Now beginning to, I, I think I, it's I, a wonderful I'm telling idea. them stories and asking them to write, yeah. and I'm finding that some of the people that I've shared the story with have now begun to write, and they call me back and say, "I cannot believe what's done, what is done to my people." Mm. One CEO said to me that his son was estranged from his dad for 26 years, but after his dad got this letter. The dad came to the office and they put the son and the dad back together. Mm. So it's, it's really, it's done wonderful things. And it's certainly consistent with the whole person. You yeah. know, as you tell us about bringing a whole person, because the whole person is really, yeah. has a constellation of other whole people attached to them, as it you turns bet. out. Um, so Indra, as you look around, I'm sure you've noticed that, um, uh, and talked to some of the people ahead of time, our students come from all over the world. Mm. Um, I seem to recall that your first real time of any length um, mm. in America was here at Yale SOM. Um, can you talk a little bit about how it was when you first arrived here um, as, as uh, someone from a different culture and how you found it and, and just how it was and how you reflect upon it now as a grown-up uh, who's been around the world for many years and living many places? Mm. I think Yale then and Yale now, SOM then and mm. yes, SOM now are very different places. You know, I was in SOM, um, I was the third group to go through SOM. I graduated in 1980, long, 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 long time ago. And uh, didn't have the amount of support systems that we have mm -hmm. today. Yale was not as diverse as it is today. Didn't have as many women, international students. Um, I mean, none of those support systems mm. existed. So it was a pretty lonely place. Mm. But there were three women in the admissions office, Pat Porter, Sue, and uh, who was the third one? I don't remember, uh, but I definitely three of them. Pat and Sue. Uh, and it, um, the, the older she lady. She was a yeah, German, yeah. or yeah, 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 yeah. That. I can't remember. I, I can see her face. Yeah, me too. Um, but the three, of them, <laughs> the three of them decided they would take me under their wing. And mm. it was just unbelievable. The rest of Yale, there were no support systems. But Pat, Sue, and Anna, I think the three of them said, we'll take you under our wing. And uh, every day in the morning when I used to be down, just go to them and they would be my three moms and you know, take good care of me. And then the cutest thing is how they went around New Haven looking for that Indian family that could feed me because I was a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and they found these families that would send me care packages. 
<laughs> I mean, this is the kind of help that I got. You could have learned to cook, Indra. That would have was. I was. Sharon, <laughs> believe it or not, believe it or not, I lived in Hall of Graduate Studies. There was no kitchen facility. <laughs> so a month later, I moved to Hadley Hall. <laughs> but you know, when you're working late uh, in, uh, in, in school, you a hard no, time. but I, I was. <laughs> Sadly, I was the official cook for the group. <coughs> so if I didn't cook, the rest of my group <laughs> didn't eat. So I was the official cook too. That's the sad part. But you know, here's the sad thing. At that time, I didn't have money. You know, mm -hmm. at, the end, at the end of the month, if I saved $5, I thought I'd died and gone to he heaven, okay? So totally and completely broke is the word. Mm -hmm. uh, no money to buy clothes, nothing, absolutely nothing. So I'd work the front desk of Hadley Hall from midnight to 5 a.m. And it paid 335 at that time. That was the <laughs> minimum wage, 335. And that money that you got in the morning, those you know, 15, 16 dollars, was the grocery money for the week. Hmm. And uh, to go to Pathmark, I think in West Haven or wherever we went to Pathmark, there was only one guy on the floor that had a car. We were all so nice to him because <laughs> that was cheaper than buying groceries uh, you know, on Temple Street, not Temple, on uh, whatever that street was parallel to that. Mm. And so these were very tough times. I mean, I think all the values one learned about being careful with your money was learned at the time when I was at SOM because I didn't have money. Mm. Especially the first year, being dead broke was a great learning experience. Now we have all these grants and loans and things we give you, isn't that right? <laughs> Not it's quite. a bigger support system, I'd say. It is a bigger support bigger system, support and system. Yale is a much more international yeah, place it is. It is definitely. than it was. It's one yeah. of the things President Levin really has done, yeah. um, which has been uh, really quite, mm. uh, quite wonderful. So, Indra, talking about international matters, I, uh, when, again, when we spoke uh, last time, you said you were thinking about moving a board meeting to someplace overseas. We do it every two years. So, and so tell yeah. me about that. Is that something that you started? How, where, do, where do you go? No, it's a, it's, it's a normal procedure it's for normal. most companies. But I think it's a bad idea. I'll tell you why. I think board meetings shouldn't be held overseas. I think we should have international trips by the board. Hmm. But board meetings themselves have so many requirements, you know, comp committee, audit committee, mm -hmm. Uh, your nominating committee, you've got to go through procedural stuff and when you're jet lagged, going through those mounds of paper and flying over your auditors, your comm consultants, your executives who don't need to be part of a board meeting is just not a good use of time. So the big lesson I've learned is mm -hmm. that um, board meetings should always be held in a time zone where jet lag is not going to be a factor. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between Dallas and New York. <laughs> and uh, to stay with that, especially when you have an older board, it's mm. very hard, okay? And if you're going to do international trips, make those strict international trips mm. so you can do it on your own schedule, not necessarily tied to a board schedule. So how much of your time are you in the States versus looking around at the rest of your operations? I'd say 50-50. And your family, how has that been? You know, that's a, another of these gendered issues. So mm. Indra has mm. several <laughs> children. Um, and yet has had a, a very ambitious career, pretty much from leaving here. Um, have you managed that? Uh, it's uh, uh, not very well. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I say that because, uh, you know, the good news, bad news is that my children don't know what it is to have a stay-at-home mom. I had a stay-at-home mom. It was fantastic. Uh, my kids don't know what it is to have a stay-at-home mom. If I come home at 4 p.m. and my daughter comes home from school, she says, Mom, is everything okay? Did you lose your job? You know, <laughs> it's a very different mindset because they've never seen mom at home. That's the good news and the bad news. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't know what it is to um, uh, you know, have mom greeting them at the door with a f snack and the house smelling like the good stuff has been made. None of that stuff. They come home to a nanny at home. Mm -hmm. okay? And so I'd say in those parts, by the traditional definition of a good mom, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I've been a good mom. Mm -hmm. um, being a role model, giving them experiences they've never had, taking them places, giving them access to all kinds of uh, mind-blowing experiences, sure, I've made all of that possible. I think the person that has it toughest, especially if in today's world, I hope it changes before you guys uh, become CEOs, is if you're married to somebody like me, how do you cope with it? 
It's not easy. It is not easy because you go to a party or a dinner, I go with my husband, and we walk in, and at the end of dinner, I see him again. Mm -hmm. So for the three hours that we're at the dinner, we're not on the same table. Mm. I don't know where he is. I'm talking to all kinds of people. And if I don't, people say she's too standoffish. So I'm shaking hands, taking pictures. Mm. At the end of dinner, I'm looking for him because he's my ride home. <laughs> okay? So <laughs> he, he looks at me and he goes, why do I come to these events? <laughs> because I don't even enjoy it. I have to dress up like a penguin, you know, put on his black tie. He said, why am I coming to these events? I go because I need You married to. me, honey. That's yeah. why he's going. No, yeah, but you know, I realized that, maybe put it the other way, women always accepted it. You know, the same thing happened to women too when they were wives. They just accepted it because society said mm -hmm. that's the norm for the woman to just be nice, smile, and chit-chat with some other women about coupons and kids. <laughs> but for men, they didn't do that. I mean, other times I give you, we go to dinners, and I'm sitting between two men who might be world leaders and having the time of my life, having a great conversation. My husband, meanwhile, is sitting between two women who are all great people, but they have nothing of interest to him. Mm -hmm. So he's now making up conversation to have with him. He does a fantastic job. I mean, this is, I married a keeper. I mean, he does a great job, but I tell you, I, I would have a tough time being married to me. <laughs> and it's not easy. It is not easy. Well, at least on your children, my daughter often says she's grateful that I raised her with such low standards because she doesn't have to feel guilty when she goes and has her career. <laughs> <laughs> so just think about it that way. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't, you know. <laughs> So, so let us return to business. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll open the floor for a, a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in a recession. Um, I see very happily you've hired some of my students. I'm just very pleased with that. Um, <laughs> how, how, is, how is the recession affecting your businesses? You're in a wide range of different businesses, mm. restaurants, beverages. We're not in lots of, Long time gone. Lots, lots of stuff, Frito, all kinds of things. Yeah. So, how is it affecting different pieces? There's no question that in the developed world, and I say Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and North America, we are in a tremendous downturn. There's no question about it. Any which way you look at it, um, it's impacting consumers in a significant way. Uh, there's an age of thrift. People are afraid to spend money. And um, People are being very careful about what they shop for and where they shop for and when they shop for mm -hmm. it. We've never seen people make lists for groceries as they do now. Everything is a planned purchase. In the past, they'd go to a single grocery store and buy whatever they wanted. Now they're willing to make three grocery store trips to even get the best value. Um, so pricing is going to be very critical. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's being very uh, carefully watched is if somebody wants to spend $5 on beverages, not $5.99, not $6.99, as they used to before. They mentally say, I'm going to spend $5 on beverages. So how you do price pack mm. architecture to make sure you give them the right package size for mm. certain dollar outlay mm. is becoming a more important factor mm. than just saying, what's the price of a 24-pack beverage uh, mm -hmm. package? So we have to think differently about the consumer. And how they shop when they get their paycheck versus the middle of the month or the week after the paycheck, the patterns are totally different. Mm. So how you promote and deal in the different windows has to change. Mm. Now the good news is whether the economy is up or down, people still have to eat and drink. Mm -hmm. And um, they say that in this down economy, people are renting more DVDs, not even going to movie theaters. The rental, DVD rentals have gone through the roof. They're renting more DVDs, staying home, you know, drinking their Diet Pepsi and eating their Doritos and having a good time. <laughs> okay, so business is okay. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you where we see the soft underbelly. Convenience stores used to be the place which was a leading indicator of the economy. Because your construction worker, your hourly worker got up in the morning, pulled up in a convenience store, bought a six pack of, of Mountain Dew and four bags of Doritos, put it in the pickup truck and went to the construction site. That construction worker doesn't exist in many, many parts of the country. Mm. So that, until that hourly worker and that construction worker jobs come back, 
the foundation of the economy is not strong. So we need to get that going again. Um, the second thing is we've talked to convenience store retailers who have ATM machines in the C store. And they look at the withdrawals every week. And if you look at the withdrawals, consumers are coming in and withdrawing $10 at a time and paying a $1.75 service charge. Drawing $10 at a time just to shop in a convenience store for just what they need for the week because they don't even want to go to a big grocery store. And their balances tend to be $20, which is a huge change from two years ago. Mm -hmm. So these are the leading indicators that are very worrisome. And we need to find a way to get, you know, over the next two or three years, two or three million low-end jobs back in, you know, the real workhorse jobs back in to get the economy moving again. We have an uphill battle in front of us. Is anyone from our administration talking to you? Oh, yes, um, all the time. So I know these days part of the CEO's job is dealing with the public sector. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite thing you've been doing lately? No, we're there all the time. In fact, uh, from here, I go to Washington. We have dinner with the president tonight, about 10 CEOs. They're talking with us all the time, all the time. I mean, last night we had a wonderful dinner with Peter Orzak, the head of the Office of Management mm -hmm. and Budget, going through pieces on the budget. So. Being a CEO today, uh, Washington's very, very open to our ideas. The issue is, whatever ideas CEOs give, politically can you sell it? I mean, <laughs> we've never seen such a partisan environment, so mm -hmm. politically can you sell it? So the big question is, it's not the ideas. Mm -hmm. It's how do you get Washington to accept it and act on it? And I think they like, this is where democracy works against us. Yeah. So. The, uh, yeah. But you know, that was again, a joke, guys. Again, <laughs> <laughs> again, as you remember, it is one of the things we've always done is taking yeah. seriously the public process as well as yeah. the nonprofit and the for-profit world. And I think these days it seems like that's even more important. Right.